Welcome back, my friends. Uh, welcome back to Art Nerds. This is the podcast where we talk to all of our nerdy friends about their art. Today, this evening, I've got with me Katie Baquette. Am I saying that right? Yep, you Baquet, got it. Ba- Katie Baquette. Katie, uh, first of all, thank you. It's nice to re-meet you again. Sure thing. <laughs> and yeah. um, so, Katie, what is your art? A couple of different things. So, I do like participating in the local burlesque community um, with Carnival Debauch. Um, and then I also serve uh, as co-chair on uh, Kudo Plays, which is the local board game design competition. Um, we help people create their own board games through like hosting workshops and that sort of thing. Um, and then right now I'm treasurer of Kudo, the Champaign-Urbana Design Organization, which are the parent org of Kudo Plays. And that's a little bit less creative on my part because I'm not a graphic designer or anything. But um, yeah, I really love doing those types of things. Wh- wh- where do you want to start? Oh, <laughs> Which gosh. one do you want to start with? Because um, both of them are intriguing. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I'd like to go into burlesque a little bit just because it's been a while since I've done it, actually, okay. because the pandemic hit uh, local shows especially pretty hard. How long is... Uh you said uh, theater burlesque or the mm-hmm. oh carnival debauch carnival debauch mm-hmm. um how long have they been how long has that group been together i mean that's a really good question i think a little bit over like 10 years actually really? but i've only been a part of it like maybe five or seven i'd have to look it up but we were we started to be surprised um me and the other like people in the group when we started to realize like oh yeah i've been a part of the group <laughs> for longer uh, than i have not been which was really really kind of interesting to see so Th- that is it uh mm-hmm. okay so um yeah. for us laymen who sure. uh i'm sure you get this question a lot mm-hmm. and it's part of carnival debauch's kind of mission is yeah. what exactly is burlesque because you know some my grandparents and yes. my parents are gonna say it's it's automatically gonna go to a strip show, mm-hmm. which I I I know in my heart it is not, even though I've never been to a mm-hmm. burlesque show. So, from from the source, what mm-hmm. is? I mean, sometimes it is a strip show. It kind of depends on <laughs> it depends on uh, what the type of performer you're seeing, really, and especially with like burlesque in this day and age, pre-pandemic, more like um, there was a kind of like resurgence and a renaissance that burlesque had because at some point it is stripping and then what kind of differentiates between like burlesque and um, uh, stripping is like I would say uh, the athleticism and the expectation. So with burlesque, there's often traditional aspects to it that you can include or not. Um, when someone does traditional burlesque, what you think of is something that we call uh, a slut and strut. So that's like you're wearing a, a gown and there are gloves and um, there might be a like feather boa or okay. a uh, some sort of prop that you're using and then like you strip down from there. But there's also neo-burlesque, which is is uh, really interesting. A lot of kind of new takes um, on burlesque. Some there's gorelesque too, which are our goth sisters, uh, and <laughs> things like that. There's boylesque as well, which is men taking on the art, which is very interesting. And a lot of these were kind of rediscovered, I think, as people wanted to still like uh, strip and express their bodies, but do it in a more like fun way with more trappings. Um, and then, of course, like I say athleticism just because when it comes to pole dancing and things like that, okay. that is gymnastics. Uh, yeah, <laughs> agreed. Is, uh, yeah, agreed. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, so things like the, the traditional fan dance, mm-hmm. the giant fans. and Yeah. Because yeah, I know those, some of those things come out of old mm-hmm. vaudeville stuff. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's much more associated with, yeah, old vaudeville and kind of had a return to that. And then there were also, like, modern showgirls who have kind of, like, brought burlesque back. And okay. Dita Von Teese was also a person who brought kind of classical burlesque back into the, like, um, main zeitgeist kind of as mainst- well. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Main so, uh, mm-hmm. so how would you classify burlesque versus just mm-hmm. generic strip club? I mean, it depends on... Let's see. It's difficult to say. Uh, I did burlesque as a hobby. And so I'm not one of the people who actually make a living uh, doing burlesque. And back in the day, I would have said that um, people who like do exotic dancing or strip, they might. Um, that is probably like their day job, whereas I identified burlesque as much more of a hobby. Okay. But now that's like not true. People are able to do burlesque as like as a day job and be performers. And 
that way. So I think that's really special. But I also identify kind of like the location that you're going to be performing. And uh, so like you might be like at a strip club in order to do that type of exotic dance work. But also more and more, I think the lines get blurred. I know that what makes mine a little bit different from uh, exotic dancing or uh, stripping at a strip club is that the... Uh, I make a bunch of kind of ridiculous props usually <laughs> and those aren't normally seen I think as as with traditional like stripping and exotic dancing for example mm, so <laughs> I <laughs> dare I ask mm -hmm, I usually like to specialize in large props which is a very silly thing to specialize in you should not do this but um, <laughs> there's lots of different flavors of burlesque and mine if I had to break it down it would be um, it is classic burlesque usually, and then it's usually pretty campy. Okay. Um, and I always like to include a type of like joke in, in there if I can. So one of my pieces that looks a little bit more traditional <laughs> until you get to the very end, um, let's see. Uh, it's to the song Good Kisser by Lake Street Dive. And oh, I I'm love wearing, Lake Street Dive. Me too, they're my favorite <laughs> band. I'm wearing a traditional, like, you know, black gown that happens to zip up the side because it's a, it's a burlesque gown. Um, and then I have a big red boa that is huge and fluffy that I made myself out of, like, all of the red tool in this town. <laughs> and at the very end, uh, as you're using it to obscure yourself, I, like, take it off, and then you can actually form it, because it is so fluffy, into what look like giant lips. <gasps> so I always try to have my props do something a little something, silly. Something yeah. fun, something mm -hmm. unexpected. Yeah. Okay, now is that kind of... Mm -hmm. It sounds to me... Okay, I recently talked to... Uh, Jess Schliff. Mm -hmm. Do you know Jess? Yes, I do. Yeah. And and they were talking about their drag king stuff. Yeah. And it sounds very similar in the sense that mm -hmm. it's not just a generic get up there and tease kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's a character. It's a persona. Yes. It's a personalized performance. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Or I think it's accurate. And like that's definitely what I do with my burlesque. Some people are like less jokey. Uh, some people are more like sultry and they're just there to like, you know, titillate and do that sort of thing, which is fine and great. I find that when I have that formula for my routines, I kind of get a little bit bored because it's just like, oh, gee, I wonder what's going to happen. I bet she's going to take her gloves off. Like right. it's, and so I like for all of my routines to have something unexpected. I usually say it's like three layers of joke and a surprise if I can fit it into a right. three minute song. Um, but so, yeah, it's very, very, what I do is very similar to drag and that's not what every burlesque person does. But, right. But, yeah. it, but I think the approaches seem, sounds similar where mm -hmm. you take your persona yeah. for lack of a better word and, mm -hmm. and really make it your own yep and yeah. then yeah playing with audiences expectations while you're doing that is also extremely fun um because just like with drag and burlesque you're up there you know you're being perceived a certain way and then to the, like i know what you're expecting here and then to try to like uh, break that is always something that's been really entertaining to me and unfortunately it results in me using a bunch of props and a bunch of costume pieces <laughs> But does it work? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's great. Uh, you, you mentioned, you, uh, you said mm -hmm. your goth sisters. Mm -hmm. You used the term sisters. I did. Is, is that uh, kind of how the community feels about itself and each other? Mm -hmm. or? It's getting more inclusive now. It used to be very like sisters and like woman focused. But now, of course, we're identifying with our like non-binary uh, okay. friends and siblings as well. So, so that's usually what I say uh, to like ally myself with um, people who are strippers and other people who choose to do sex work uh, because burlesque is part of that very tangentially in my experience, of course, because, yeah, it's just a hobby. But right. right. I, I, I suspect it. Mm hmm. It, it runs the gamut in terms of, yeah, like you said, how hobby versus how mm -hmm. professional you can get with it. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, 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 there was something else I was going to ask you. Sure. What was it? What was it? Um, how did you get into it? How did I get into it? Yeah. Oh, I mean, gosh. and mm -hmm. I'll start with that question. <laughs> sure. Let's see. I think. There's a couple of different ways. First off, it's something I kind of always knew I wanted to do. Um, just uh, there's a, a Facebook group that I'm a part of because I'm, you know, a millennial, and so we still have our Facebook groups. Right. Uh, and 
in it, which is, it happens to be about a certain line of clothing. Some people posted something called their femme awakening. And it's just like when you saw something extremely like femme when you were a kid that led you to be like, wow, I want to do that. Okay. And it just turned out that mine was watching Jessica Rabbit and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> and then there's a, uh, for all intents and purposes, a burlesque show in Blazing Saddles, which my dad probably shouldn't have let me watch when I was that young. Um, but seeing those two instances, I was like, pretty lady on stage doing a thing what what is this i would like to know more and somehow it about clicked this. with you it did and so i would always kind of like look out for those opportunities but you know growing up um i was still like a straight a kid and like a very studious like girl and was kind of like uptight um and then came here and saw that there were actually opportunities to do um like uh, burlesque and that type of thing and so i tracked the people who run Carnival de Botch Down after one of their performances that I saw in the Lincoln Square Mall several years ago. And I was just like, how do I do this? And they <laughs> were like, um, email so-and-so, and then you can probably be a kitten. And that is what, that's usually how people get into it. Um, so usually you find the local performers. You can take classes. They didn't have classes in this community uh, at that time, but they do now, which is awesome. Oh, fantastic. Through Defy Gravity, yeah. Um, and then if you're really interested, uh, usually you do have to either take classes and like prove yourself that way or do what I did, which was stage kitten. And I stage kitten for about a year. What is stage kitten? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I am mm -hmm. I'm such a layman at uh, any of this. No worries. Stage kittening is the, they are the people who come on stage and clear the stage of clothing and props and oh. then also collect tips and then sort them for the dancers uh, behind the scenes after okay. that. So was yeah. that part of now, is that can that be a bit of a burlesque, or is that just a job? You're expected to dress nice. You're expected to be a part of the show. Okay. Uh, so you're expected to still be like you know pretty and like cute to look at, and also in my interpretation of it, uh, because my character is like that, still be campy and fun. And so okay. I was. Um, and yeah, I would stage kitten, and it kind of teaches you how to. Like what to expect from a show, um, okay. kind of exactly what to do, exactly like how to perform, and then also how to treat other people uh, in your, you know, in your conclave of performers. Right. So, it also sounds like it might mm -hmm. be a, a a bit of an introduction on how to deal mm -hmm. with your audience a yes. little bit, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff as well. Yeah. Inter that's that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't have anything better to say. <laughs> yeah. And then but, there was auditions. Uh, so they let me know about the auditions. And then they I think they also posted them in places. And okay. then I auditioned in front of, uh, let's see, the people who run Carl Bach, who knew me already. Um, and then I got in from there. So, yeah. So you did it the old-fashioned way. Just mm -hmm. uh, yeah. hard work, work your way up kind of thing. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, how did you come up with your... Mm -hmm. Your, your persona, your on stage persona. It is just kind of like people say when you learn how to be a clown, it's just aspects of your personality turned up to 11. So I kind of and saw a bunch of different burlesque performances and you kind of pick the ones that resonate with you. And then you have to figure out why they resonate with you. Um, and I really liked people like Dita Von Tees and Amanda Palmer more back in the day, like a few years ago. And I also really liked funny people and people who like, you know, we're more, we're more clowny. And so you just kind of take like what is fun to do and then what you can actually execute. <laughs> and cause sometimes when I try and sell a certain emotion, it does not go very well. Uh, so you kind of have to recognize what you and your body and your persona is actually good at portraying. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I kind of landed in this space where I like to do uh, very traditional stuff. Cause I happen to have a pretty like like pinup y traditional face and body okay. type, which yeah. is cool for me, but also, you know, it's kind of puts me in a certain category. Um, and then the ideas that I come up with are too silly to be serious. So I probably. So that's a nice combination. It is. It's fun. Looking very traditional <laughs> mm -hmm. and having that uh, yeah. very clean, very pretty, mm -hmm. beautiful face. And then. Yeah. Something and then something silly ridiculous coming out of it. I yeah. Bet, <laughs> I, bet it, I bet it goes over well. Yeah, I enjoy myself and I think people like it. And it's always entertaining when you can tell someone who's been to our shows before and they know my performance style because one of my favorite uh, things to do in burlesque is uh, 
increasingly smaller thing or increasingly bigger thing. In terms so, of props, you mean? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I have one song that I usually do uh, to share your address by Ben Platt and like for the chorus I bring out like a key that is like a foot long and my friend who had been to many of our shows he said he saw that and he's like there's going to be a bigger key and sure enough <laughs> the next one's three feet long and the next one is hiding under a sheet and it's like five feet big and <laughs> so the thing gets progressively bigger so it obscures your body and oh that's... so you use that as part of the exactly the oh I get yep. it I get it and that's also why that's also what progressively smaller thing is too so the way I've done that in the past is um, Halloween show crowd pleasers only is my rule for when I do Halloween shows um, but I had you know just your cloak, a pretty dress, and then a big witch hat. Under that witch hat, you'll never guess what it is. It's a smaller oh, witch hat. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> under that witch, smaller witch hat, nothing. Very disappointing. I turn around, witch hat pasties. Like, the point is. Oh, very like, good. So it's, it's all So the joke, jokes. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and not all burlesque is like that. It just happens to be what entertains me. But that's, uh, what, that, that's what you get out of it, exactly. though. There's a, there's a sense of humor about it. Yeah. That's marvelous. Kind of like taking yeah, what people's expectations are and being like, ha-ha. So there's a little bit of vaudeville, at least in your performance. There is, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very, um, mm -hmm. So how do, uh, another question I'm sure you get all the time. How does your family or your mm -hmm. relatives or anybody, how do they mm -hmm. feel about all this? Do they support you? Do they care? Do they... I mean, I was kind of surprised, uh, let's see, that they were, like, cool with it. But also, by the time I got into it, I was not only, uh, like, in college, I was in grad school. So it's kind of like, oh, Katie's going to do her life, and that's fine. And on some level, they kind of, like, expected that amount of, like, extroversion from me because my... Uh, sister and my dad and I would always be like singing or dancing uh like in right. in our home and so we were always kind of used to that level of expression and okay. uh burlesque is just you know a type of performance that is too too big to be contained to be reasonable right. I think so it kind of was like oh Katie wants to do burlesque oh I guess that makes okay. sense <laughs> so again hearing you talk more mm -hmm. uh so burlesque isn't just mm -hmm. the the tease the, the strip tees of four. It is a mm -hmm. performance. It's yeah. There's much. It sounds partial circus, partial vaudeville, mm -hmm. partial yeah, crazy Vegas show. Yeah, and that's that's what I get out of it. Some people do do it all for the tees, but I like when there's like a little bit more like decoration to it. Right. I mean, it sounds like mm -hmm. a, I don't know. I, in my mind, it's so very colorful. Yes. As opposed to just a dingy strip tees, mm -hmm. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, again, what about the... Now, one of my questions normally I ask people... Sure. Um, what about this turns you on? Let's see. And that might be, not be the right word for this conversation, but <laughs> a phrase, but, mm -hmm. but I ask everybody, what about it sparks mm -hmm. you? Let's see. And you may have answered part of it already, but... I mean, I do love... Like I said, I love doing, uh, taking um, people's expectations and kind of like altering them for what they see. And there are like two other main parts of burlesque that I love doing. Okay, I'm going to say three. First is the ridiculousness of it. Um, like proposing how to make this thing more sexual so that you can make it a part of a burlesque show. But it's still ultimately silly. Like it's very, very fun to bounce those ideas back and forth and to figure out how to make um, something so that it can be a burlesque routine like something I just can't work out is how to make myself a huge life-size PB and jelly sandwich and I hadn't figured out the ending to it yet and I don't think I ever will um, and that's okay uh, the, but now that yeah. I've got it in my head mm -hmm. I'm gonna start thinking about it please so do the other thing is um, one of the things that I absolutely love about burlesque and especially like a well-executed act is that it is as beautiful as a play or a choral performance and this thing and like a lip sync and drag where this thing should happen in your brain um, when you see a really, really well executed performance. In, in a lip sync and drag, we're all probably familiar with RuPaul's Drag Race. Mm -hmm. One of the things I look for um, when they are lip syncing at the very end is like who is actually singing this song like who actually has it like in their soul who has it in their preparation if you're a chess nerd like who actually who who's 
does it look like who its mouth is coming out of? Like, who's actually singing it? Right. Um, and in plays, like, you also get that. You're like, woof, that person really believes that. And, like, for a minute, the, the human is gone. They're just the character. And then for burlesque, what I look for is, does it look like their body is conducting the music? Because part of the thing that you do in burlesque is you use a lot of the, um, you know, the RL cues um, to, to move and use that to kind of like execute like how exactly you use something. And so, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. That's mm -hmm. it's, so it's dance. So it's a lot more. Mm -hmm. So your music choices are a lot more yeah. geared toward a movement dance aspect versus mm -hmm. just some random thing exactly yeah and you can use what I usually tell people when uh, we have what I call solo study hall uh, me and my other like close friend um, and we basically just like run our solo numbers for each other and yeah one of the things I say is that every prop should have a reason that it exists mm -hmm. and like you have to let the you have to let the song tell you um, what's happening and how you're taking something off that sounds very basic theater mm -hmm. you know the script, the script is your Bible mm -hmm. and if you don't can't find the clues there mm -hmm. you, you may have to make them up but you have a set of parameters mm -hmm. sounds like the same thing with your music mm -hmm. and then there's this rule uh, called Chekhov's gun mm -hmm. uh, Chekhov anyway yeah. it's the idea that you make a big deal about hanging a rifle over the fireplace in Act One, mm -hmm. and then if you never use it again, your audience is disappointed. So, mm -hmm. if the gun is there for a reason, it's, you know, yeah. use it. If it's not, don't put it on the mantle in Act One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I definitely love Chekhov's gun burlesque. Like, yeah. So <laughs> it sounds so burlesque is much more theater, mm -hmm. and not just any. Well, it's, it sounds like a very unique. Mm -hmm. branch of theater. I like to think that it is, and this is something, once I was uh, in a car for several hours uh, with Ann Lukeman, who runs uh, CU Adventures in Time and Space, mm -hmm. and we talked about the performative aspects of both burlesque and escape rooms, because if you think about it, they are both something that is designed to like have a narrative, to excite somebody, mm -hmm. and also to come apart and go back together again. And so the thing is, is that the thing has to come apart in a way that's a little bit unexpected for the audience, but completely doable for the person who is actually performing it. Right. And the tricky thing that we talked about there is the narrative. Um, how do you, in an escape room, keep making stories about why you have to decode things and right, right. Uh, break into stuff? And in burlesque, my favorite thing is to figure out in this song, what is my motivation to be removing clothing? And that's the, <laughs> it's the hardest thing for, for novices to figure out exactly why they're stripping. And I usually attend um, at Gen Con, which is a board game convention. Yeah, it's the big uh, I gaming usually, convention. I usually always attend the burlesque class because it is very fun uh, to go to burlesque classes, especially because I've been doing it for a couple of years. Um, and um, Miss Pixie Belmont usually gives out worksheets that have just a list of reasons as to why you could be stripping because that's the thing that some people forget to put in. It's like, it's too hot. It's a reverse burlesque. It's too cold. Your clothes have been possessed by a demon and they need to get off of you. And so she's also very like theatric and narratively driven as well. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I should say. Uh, but yeah, finding the like narrative through line so this, and making it make sense yeah. is important. No, I think it's mm -hmm. I think it's a because I think that's the kind of thing I'm interested in in the fact that you know I say the word burlesque to some people and they automatically mm -hmm. roll their eyes and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But uh -huh. I th you know but if it's such a performance and such a mm -hmm. uh, a thought provoking uh, art, a skill, a craft mm -hmm. of sorts. Yeah. That's fascinating, and I think that's what I—I mm -hmm. I think that's why this podcast is why I put it together because I want cool. to know more about it, and I want everybody to know that, that mm -hmm. everything we do is art, mm -hmm. and so and I love that. I love the, the this. So thank you for this conversation. Sure. Um, let's go back to then um, your board gaming. Sure. Uh, you're the chairman of. Mm -hmm. Say that again. You're the chairman. Ooh, I'm the co-chair of Kudo Plays, the uh, board game design competition here in town okay. in Champaign-Urbana. Do you design your own games or is it just something, mm -hmm. how'd you get into this? And it's what? tricky. So <laughs> the way I originally got into it is because Kudo Plays already existed um, and I attended the like kickoff for, I think it was their season two and I was just like, this is silly. Who wants to give themselves more homework? And then, um, <laughs> who, then, 
my now very good friend Katie Cow was just like, also we have achievement stickers for people who want to make games. And I was just like, yeah. excuse me? <laughs> you have achievement stickers? And so I was just like, this I could be into perhaps. Um, but then um, I'm a cynical person-ish, not really. Uh, I was like talking after the kickoff and I was just like, Oh, I think it was after our symposium in season two. One of our speakers was Dan Cermak, who is who was a local uh, person who worked with Volition, and now he's retired and teaching some uh, video game classes at the university. He was showing off his extensive board game collection, and the thing is, is when you collect board games, much like collecting novels, you have to be very specific about the genre you're collecting. He collects World War II war games, so we just watched... Okay him talk about a ton of war games and they're not very appealing to me and I also was into more traditional games so I played a lot of Ticket to Ride and right, stuff like yeah. that and I'm just like I just hate how all games are about war and trains and then my friend Tom's eyes got big he's like let's make a game called War Trains and then that became the joke <laughs> of our group is that we were actually making a game called War Trains and like the tagline was like, we're making a game called War Trains. Katie hates it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the slogan. <laughs> yep. And I did. And like we <laughs> created that game through season two of Kudo Plays. Um, we got, I think, like the replay value award, which was pretty cool. Um, and then as Kudo Plays was starting up again, I was like, how can I help be a part of this? Because I don't know if I can create a game, but I think I can help like this community grow a little bit. And so. I got added as the social media chair, I think, in season three. And then from there, it's, you know, a transient town. So people do attrition and right, leave yeah. and stuff. And so eventually, you know, I had been with Kudo Plays long enough. And I have a good enough kind of head for what to do during events that I'm one of the co-chairs. And unfortunately, that is my skill set is talking to people, knowing what to do, event planning. Um, okay. <laughs> I am terrible at homework, right. uh, folder and file structure, infrastructure design, um, <laughs> that type of stuff. Wow. Luckily, <laughs> <laughs> luckily I have a co-chair, <laughs> uh, Katie Cow, who is extremely good at all those things. So basically she will talk to no one, but she will make sure all the agendas are ready to go for the meetings and then I'll run the meeting. And, and then you're the voice. Yep. Yeah. And okay. we both kind of execute on stuff. And it's not just us on the committee either. There is about I think 10 of us, and that's kind of what you need to run a several-month program um, of this size, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so do you play a lot of games, I'm assuming? I used to play a lot of games before the pandemic. I used to go to way more <laughs> board game nights, but I still play a ton of games, yeah. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I don't know about your house, but we have mm -hmm. a coffee table that we bought mm -hmm. specifically because it had a full-size shelf underneath the coffee table, so mm -hmm. it's just loaded with our games. I need one of those, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, us too. Uh, like, so is that the only game you've designed? or War Trains is the only game I've designed. And then after you design a game and then work with Kudo Plays as much as I have, like helping people create their games, you kind of just get very, very good at dissecting like what goes into games exactly. Okay. So, so is, is your mm -hmm. job a lot of playing... Mm -hmm new games and feedback kind of thing? Then? Yes. So usually the first part of the season of Kudo Plays, it goes from like September to March, now mm -hmm. April. Um, so in like September and October, it's all public events where we tell people about what the thing is. We have the symposium where we have like kind of academic talky talks about board game design. And then we have our boot camp, which forces people to create board games within like a couple of hours using uh, random themes we come up with, mechanics, and then a bunch of okay. uh, board game pieces we bought at the idea store once. And we just force them to create a game to show them that it's possible. A lot of people that sign up for the competition come into it saying like, oh, I've had this game idea for a long time, but I've just never, you know, written it down. And our playtest convention, playtest convention, um, which happens about mid-season, is when we're like, your ideas need to be written out on papers, and if they're cards, they need to be playable. So we force people to get their ideas so actually, actually on it. a table. Yeah, because um, what... What Kudo Plays is, is actually a very secret way to teach iterative design um, because uh, it is a part of the design organization. And 
it's an extremely good way to teach really, really like rapid, rapid iteration. Right. Uh, because you actually have to come up with something, and then you actually, Terror of Terrors, have to play it with people, and, and they have to give you feedback. Right. And then you have to incorporate that feedback. Right. And it is very, very interesting to watch people go through that process. I think that's the worst part of the process, though, yeah. is actually spitting it out and mm -hmm. giving it somebody else to think about. Yep. And I, as a creator myself, I. Oh, yeah, it's I've got hard. a million ideas, and mm -hmm. you know, some of them I just will not put in front of people. Yep. Some of them I've done it like that. Like, okay, mm -hmm. I need to know by the, the next hour and a half what you want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just got to get the thing out. You just got to get the thing out. And then after that, it's workshops that are all focused on the, uh, on the participants, on the teams that have registered. So our biggest pull for the last couple of years has been the like how to present your game workshop, which is to teach people who have just, you know, done really, something really important. They've gotten the game out of their head and it's on paper and they need to explain to somebody. We kind of teach them how to explain it. And it's also secretly the rules <laughs> writing workshop because getting, <laughs> getting hobbyists to write their rules <laughs> is so hard. And I get it. I hate doing homework as well. But the thing that people get held up on is like, no, I don't want to write the rules yet because it's not finished yet. And we're like, you don't understand. It's never going to be finished. This is art. Like you just, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you, right. That's you have right. to take it, it is art. at one spot and then say it's good from there. And that's also partially, it's also what burlesque has taught me, like reduce the thing down to as few components as it needs mm -hmm. to be, because the least complicated it is, the better it's going to go over. And that's true of board games and burlesque. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and other things, honestly. Illustration sometimes. Uh, and yeah, my, my like, puppetry work, yeah. Yep. That's another day, though. Reduce it down uh, yeah, so it, it can be done easily. Um, and then I forgot what the second rule is, but it's probably like just listen to feedback and yeah. consider incorporating it. Because yeah. I. I yeah, because you never think about opening mm -hmm. up a new game and then reading the rules and like. Mm -hmm. How difficult is it? Because I've got a couple games that are just like, mm -hmm. oh man. Oh yeah. And then some are just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Man. And so I did play a lot of games. Uh, and then one thing that we do also in Kudo Plays is we kind of try to help mentor the teams by playing their games, kind of getting an idea of what they want to develop, and also like either uh, teaching them the language of board game stuff or um, just like working with them within that language of what mechanics to use and what kind of emotions they want to be present in the board game. And then we suggest other games that they can play uh, to get an idea of how to. other people have executed that. That's always tricky because sometimes people are like, oh no, this game already exists. Blah. We're like, you don't <laughs> understand. The game that you make is extremely unique because it will be coming from you. Right. And some people are like, hey, do you guys take our ideas? And we're like, we're a branch off of a nonprofit. Like we <laughs> have so little to do with this. The only thing we take are pictures to inspire other people to get into board game design. Some people have gone on to get their games published or self-published or pitched to publishers or even like taken to Gen Con and wow. that sort of thing, which is very cool. Um, but yeah, people who are like, what if you guys steal our ideas? We're like, no one wants your board game idea. Board games are so hard to bring to life that yeah. you have to love it. And you have to be dedicated and know it's like the correct one. Uh, yeah, I would imagine that's a kind of a cutthroat market too, and trying to get a mm. new board game out and published. And it can be tough. It's gotten, it had gotten easier. We've uh, we've existed long enough that we have seen the renaissance of board games come with like, I would say the introduction of Settler Catan to America mm -hmm. because in America, board games were very like. Um, Pathfinding games like Candyland, Monopoly, um, Monopoly yeah, yeah. Shoots and Ladders, yeah. so like silly kids games, and then um, gambling and war games um, are other like types of like games that are played here and have the essence of what we call like Ameritrash. Um, so <laughs> there's lots of take that. There's kind of simpler rules, and also kind of we have folk games, which is kind of cool, like how Uno and Dominoes have okay. like developed in our culture. And then um, when Sellers of Catan came over from Germany, basically it was like, oh, there can be mid-level games that require a certain amount of strategy, um, but then are also like still fun to play. Right. And then that opened kind of the floodgates for the design of like many more types of board games. And then we had the Kickstarter era, 
And that was great yeah. for people who wanted to self-publish or even get the attention of larger publishers. And now we've come all the way back around to if you want to launch a Kickstarter, you kind of have to be pretty official. You kind of right. have to have a publisher and have to have art already done. And you already have it has had, to be ready to go. You kind of yeah have to talk to the warehouses in China already about manufacturing. So... Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. We've kind of come all the way back around. But crowdfunding um, has been a really, really great thing for the board game industry. Yeah. And is it all this part of your the, mm -hmm. the, the Kudo games in terms of the, mm -hmm. the workshop and the competition? Well, what we do is we kind of, we are people who participate in like the board game community, uh, but we don't do like absolutely everything. So we don't uh, necessarily like help to get games published, but we do do is we host a marketing workshop <laughs> that is actually uh -huh. coming up on the 20th that uh, where we get people to speak from the board game industry that talk about different avenues that people might want to pr like pursue if they want to get their game published. And not everybody does. Some people just want to develop their game to a point where they can put a bow on it and play it with their fans. Families. Right. Um, some people just want to make like a beautiful, like a beautiful work of art that is also a board game, or just get this idea out that they have. And some people do want to go all the way and publish it. And like we usually follow that progress and see what's happening. And you know, it's not the easiest thing to do. I'm sure. But now we know more and more people in the board game industry because as we. Um, do this process. We've also like given a talk at Gen Con. Um, we also, Katie, Cow, and Jess Chu, who are a part of Kudo Plays, are board game agents and can like pitch board games for different people and have picked up some of the Kudo really? Plays games. Wow. Yeah. And so, and I think a few of the Kudo Plays games have been published. Uh, most like distinctly uh, comes to mind. It's called End of the Trail, which is like an Oregon Trail game, and actually helped launch the uh, publishing company Elf Creek Games, which is local to here. So I, yeah, yeah, okay. You know Elf Creek Games? I've heard maybe? of the Elf cool. Creek Games. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's fantastic. So I had friends. no idea that this mm -hmm. uh, this, that little this little cottage mm -hmm. project existed here in Champaign. Yeah. The the other part of it is that. Uh, especially with Kudo and Kudo Plays, um, we wanted to foster the design community right. because the design community cannot be too insular because you need other people to look at your thing. Agreed, agreed. Um, <laughs> and also you need other people to talk to about how hard thing is as well. A few shoulders to cry on if yeah. necessary. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are so many like weird resources that are kind of in the know with people who are in the industry that we basically wanted to make getting into board game design as easy as possible um, within the board game design community you'll see a lot of you'll see a lot of white guys and we kind of wanted to disrupt that a little bit or at least try and the way that we could do it best was to try and make a competition that gets everybody through and gives you all the tools you need for as low a cost as possible um, and that's really been, you know, that's really challenging. So we think that there are games living in people's brains that would be great, but a lot of people are barred by, you know, the regular things of life getting yeah, in the right, way of yeah. designing a board game. Just, yeah, yeah life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen the board game industry, or at least in, mm -hmm. at least in Champaign here, is it, is it getting bigger or is it? <clears throat> I feel like it got bigger, um, but again, we had a pandemic. And right, I and, I, and I, I has it, it's, it's mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody I talk to, yeah. it's the same thing. Well, since the pandemic. Since the pandemic. But definitely, I think, yes. Um, there started to, so Titan Games and Go For Mafia Games were the two big game stores in town. And then, uh, let's see. <clears throat> I think, was it Slot and Wing that also sold some board games for a while? And then Enchantment Alley came onto the scene as well. And they mm -hmm. were each having their individual game nights and then Magic Draft nights sometimes. I know Go for Mafia specializes more in minis and war games like that. Right. Oh, we also, Champagne Urbana hosted something called Winter War, which is, its tagline is the best kept secret in the Midwest because it's a war gaming convention. Um, and it is pretty secret because <laughs> it's a very old war gaming convention. That's what I'll say about it. Um, they're, they're an interesting crowd out there. Uh, oh, and also, I totally forgot this community has a very, very long and storied past with uh, vampire LARPing. Uh, so that's, but that's more from the university side of things. And then, oh yeah, the video game studio that is in this town yeah, as well. Yeah, so, Volition lives here too, right? Yep. So the board game like area definitely grew with like the with more stores happening. Right. I totally forgot about. Uh, Dr. G's, oh, in, Dr. G's in the mall. Yep. Yeah, they're so interesting over there. And so 
there were definitely a bunch of uh, commercial areas to support the mm -hmm. board game kind of like habit. And then um, bars started also having local game nights in conjunction with like us at Kudo Plays and also with local board game oh, like stores too. That's so a great idea. It is. And it started, I think, I'm not saying all bars started doing board game nights because of us. What I am saying is that um, <laughs> Kudo Plays started because it was just the board game night that Kudo would have in um, quality, I think, back in those days. We have since moved to having our monthly game night every third Monday at the Hyatt Place in downtown Champaign. Okay. Because at one point, people were bringing, like, camping lights to put on board games. What I'm trying to say is it gets very dark in quality <laughs> um, at around 8 o'clock, and we couldn't see. Um, so that's been fun. And now I know Poor Bros does their game nights, I think, is it on Tuesdays? And then Kudo Plays still hosts game nights, um, our monthly game night in Champaign, and then a game night every second and fourth Saturday wow. in Cafe and Co. in Urbana. So I'm, I'm playing a lot of games. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're also making those opportunities for people in the Kudo Plays competition to bring and play test their games as so, well. So those folks yeah. also will play mm -hmm. in the, the game nights and stuff. Yep, and then we also it. have additional like play right. test nights just for the teams. Okay. Uh, to, so maybe they're not playing with strangers all the time. A little safer. Okay. A little safer. Yeah. Uh, it's usually other game designers who understand like mm -hmm. what is uh, reasonable feedback and what isn't. Right. So if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes perfect, perfect sense. Okay. Favorite game that mm. has maybe come out of Kudo mm -hmm. Plays? Oh, gosh. Ooh, those are different. And so favorite game and then favorite game with Kudo Plays are different things. What okay. is my favorite game with Kudo Plays? And I'm sure that changes. It does. On a daily, monthly, weekly basis. Mm -hmm. So right now, what comes to mind? Favorite game? Oh, I'm going to think of more as we keep talking, but like the ones that come to mind very first would be like, let's see. Um, there was one called Most Dangerous Game, which I really liked. It was kind of like um, a game similar. I think it was called Hunt for Dracula, where uh, there's hidden movement. And um, in Dracula, you're trying to find Dracula and you're all, you know, uh, the people in Dracula, you're Mina and John, and you're trying to find right. him, and he's moving hiddenly. Um, and then this person kind of took it and reversed it and made the most dangerous game where you can see that person's movement, but everyone else is moving hidden on a jungle board because he's, it's the most dangerous game. He's trying to hunt you down. So Interesting. That was, I thought that was fun. I always like games with a lot of theme. Um, and then one, and completely opposite, the abstract games tend to be kind of fun as well. Uh, Zach Kedish, who's uh, a local here designed um, isominoes, and basically it's isome isometric dominoes. Um, so you kind of have to make triangles out of your pieces, and some of them have stars in them, and you get points for how many of those you align. So, I also love the role-playing games that come out of Kudo Plays, and we do tell people that um, our game nights can best fit games that can be played in like half an hour to or 30 minutes to about 90 minutes just because that's the limits we have on our time but some people make role playing games and there was one that I played um, that was themed like you're a rock band and you kind of have to go off of each other kind of improving what your rock band's experience is in oh. your first gig and your rehearsals and stuff and that I, does always, sound like fun. I always think it's fun when they Figure when people figure out how to put improv in as well. Yeah. And there's many more games that I love very oh, much sure that I will think of <laughs> at some point. <laughs> lists and lists and lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then my favorite game game is probably still Atlantis Rising, which is published through Elf Creek Games. Atlantis? I don't know this mm -hmm. one. Atlantis Rising. I actually go to conventions for Elf Creek, and uh, it is one of my jobs to do the demos <laughs> for okay. it because I liked it so much. Oh, fantastic. Uh, Elf Creek Games developed... Uh, the Kudo Plays game into the trail, so that was awesome. And uh, Mike Henson was the one who like designed that game, uh, along with Brent Dickman. And they started Elf Creek Games, and then they found a game that had been previously published called Atlantis Rising, that was a cooperative game where you're all counselors for the doomed city of Atlantis, mm -hmm. and it is sinking and it is doomed. You have to work together to build something to get the people off of the island and away. Um, and it's really fun because I like cooperative games. Yeah. But basically they were working with the designer to design the second edition of it and the designer Galen Cecil is very interesting he took all of the complaints anybody had with the first edition and put them in a spreadsheet and addressed them 
one at a time. And so he was at a distance. And then because Kudo Plays had like ended for that season, I was like, eh, I'm not going to as many game nights now. And then like Mike and Brent were like, would you like to help us play test this game? And I was like, yes. So, <laughs> so. that is what happened with that one. Um, so but, it's yeah. a little closer to your heart then. A it's little. a little closer to my heart, but it did exist before Kudo Plays. But I mean, yeah. That's fun. Mm-hmm. It's great. That's a. You, you sound like you lead a very exciting life, or at least a very. I mean. Interesting. I do what I can to keep myself entertained. I guess. <laughs> but is it art? Of course it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Last couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Other than the art forms that you work in now, mm -hmm. is there one that you would like to try that you have never tried? Um, I definitely want to try and get into puppetry because I think it's really ridiculous and also it is like licensed to be completely funny and that's always something that I've been interested in and yeah do you see that being part mm -hmm. of your burlesque uh most certainly <laughs> um my friend my friend Shirley who performs as Tizabit isn't it like we would talk all the time about how to like bring kind of a sort of like puppetry into our burlesque and it has like you know, been it has been in some performances, which is interesting. So I'd love to get into it because I think that'd be fun. Um, part of me also wants to try clowning, but is also extremely terrified of that because the what you have to do to be a clown is insane. You have to understand your entire audience's expectations and exactly how to mm -hmm. subvert them with perfect comedic timing in a way that makes them, you know, not beat you up. Like right. you have yeah. to, <laughs> you have to be surprising and funny to them. And that's more terrifying than being a stand up comedian. I think, um, that being said, sure. We want to do stand up. Can we do stand up? Probably not, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you might try it someday. We'll see. I got into also like embroidery, but I'm mostly embroidering like pinup and other like neo-traditional tattoo motifs <laughs> and sometimes I'm just like man I wish I could just draw pinups because I would just draw myself as a pinup all the time if I could that's what photoshop's for mm, true <laughs> Maybe. then I gotta have photoshop <laughs> okay that's another problem okay. and put it on a laptop that goes like oh this program is heavy <laughs> and then I have to reconsider like do I build my own pc uh, and go through that struggle again I don't excuses, know. excuses. I don't <laughs> like homework. I like doing the thing. <laughs> you made that very clear, yes. <laughs> Is there an art form that you would definitely not want to try? Great question. Is there an art form I don't want to try? I mean, I love my friends who do aerial performances like uh, pole dancing and silks and trapeze and things like that. I know that it's not for me. Okay. I am very on the ground and I've taken, you know, pole fundamentals in those classes as well. And they, let me tell you, they're hard. <laughs> they are so hard. And I really, really admire um, all the people who can do it very well. But within my physical capabilities, <laughs> it, just, <laughs> it just ain't. Yeah. Um, which no, is I get it. I Mm -hmm. Love to be able to do that stuff, but mm -hmm. I'm old and I'm heavy, and I just uh, it ain't mm -hmm. for me anymore. It's tough. I yeah. acknowledge that it's great, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazing, and again, I think at least in you know, for me being an older human being on this planet, the idea mm -hmm. of pole dancing has mm -hmm. gone from tardy and trashy to mm -hmm. okay, that's freaking amazing what you mm -hmm. can do. So yeah, I yeah. think that's interesting too. Mm -hmm. um, last question. Last question. Sure. Where can we see some of your art? Oh, gosh. You know, <laughs> when Carnival Botch has a show, you'll see it on our social media and also whichever, like, place is putting it out. Right now, we don't have any shows planned, unfortunately. But I can say that there is going to be a vaudeville-type show happening at the Rose Bowl on April 9th. I will not be in it, but I will be there. Okay. Uh, because I only had a week to submit the thing, and then they also wanted a video recording of your rehearsal. And the way that... Carmel Debauch works is usually we have a theme for the show and then all the performers submit like three ideas they have with their songs and then the people who run the show kind of like get back to us about which ones we do and then we develop it from there. Okay. So this application was just like, can we get a video uh, performance of what you plan to do? And I was like, within a week? Not me. Just didn't make the wire. Yep. And also it happens to be on April 9th, which is the same day as Akuto Plays Grand Exhibition. So oh, I was yeah. like could I go to the grand exhibition with my hair in curlers? And I was like, 
It's just not a good, it's not a good combination of a show good, and also the biggest event we have over on the board game side. So I was like, I will go as an attendee. Okay. So if you want to see local vaudeville and like burlesque type stuff, a variety show, that'll be the Rose Bowl April 9th. And okay. then as for Carnival Debauch stuff, just... Do they have a website? Pay, they, uh, ooh, they should. They should. I know uh, they've got a Facebook site. They do. Okay, they should I'll, have CarnivalTheBotch.com. I'll have to double check. Itself. Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll double check in, right in the mm -hmm. in the, the the stuff for the podcast here. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Any place else? Or? Let's see. I'm on uh, Instagram, although I should update it more as uh, Magic Miss L. That is my burlesque name. Okay. It's a Dungeons and Dragons joke. Anyway, um, and yeah, that's our Instagram. And maybe she has a Tumblr and a Facebook. Okay, and then also at kudo, kudo.org. Mm -hmm. Is that right? For board game stuff, yeah. uh, we have yeah, just kudoplays.com. And then you can also follow us. We're more, most active on Facebook because, yeah. And then um, we also have a Discord that people can join as oh, well. It, cool. Yeah, it yeah, has yeah, it there. Yeah. But I can't, you know. No, may I have this? And I'll put you all may. of this. You may. Yeah, I'll put all of this on the, on the, the, the commenty and... Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Sweet. Below. Thank you so much sure. for taking your time out tonight and mm -hmm. visiting with us. And mm -hmm. I've had a great time. Thank Sweet. you. I have had to. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah.